So this is another talk in my series about the introduction to astronomy and this is Beyond Pluto, Arakoth, Ultima Thule and Object MU69. This is really the story of what happened with the New Horizons spacecraft after it had flown past Pluto and they realised that it still had some fuel left. So discovered by the Hubble Space Telescope on the 26th of June 2014, giving it the name 2014 MU69. You can uh, turn the MU69 into the 26th of June if you know how to do the, the uh, unfolding trick with those numbers. Was a little tiny object highlighted there moving across the, the star field. Got a little green ring drawn on it to make it uh, more visible for you. Let's uh, freeze that motion and overlay it. Here is the little tiny dot moving against the background stars. This uh, little tiny object way out in the outer solar system. It's only about 30 kilometers across, very tiny. For comparison, here is asteroid Itokawa. It's roughly the same sort of shape as we think a lot of these bodies are, these potato shaped rubble piles that look like they've been stuck together. So that was a photograph that a Japanese uh, spacecraft took some years ago and we think that MU69 is probably going to be rather small and therefore not have a nice round spherical shape because these little tiny objects just don't have the gravity to force themselves into a round shape. So the New Horizons spacecraft there flew past Pluto and imaged both Pluto and the moon of Pluto called Charon in great detail. That's covered in one of my other talks. And the question really was with this perfectly working spacecraft with some fuel left on it, where should it go next? It couldn't stop and go into orbit. It was the fastest spacecraft ever having picked up gravity assists from various planets, including Jupiter on the way to get out to Pluto in only 10 years. It's traveling at uh, some 40,000 miles an hour relative to the Earth, and it just didn't have the fuel to slow down, but it did have enough fuel to maneuver a little bit. And so the idea was that potentially there might be something out there. And that led to the search for potential targets. And three were discovered, PT-1, that we uh, talked about a little bit at the start of this talk, PT-2 and PT-3, all on fairly similar orbits, because they'd have to be. The spacecraft couldn't really change its trajectory very much. It had flown all the way from the inner solar system to Pluto, so it was pretty much on course out. And you can see at the top of the screen there the orbits of PT-1, PT-2 and PT-3. Of course, PT means potential target. And PT-1 was selected, 2014 MU69, discovered by the Hubble Space Telescope. And the idea was, as shown in the little animation, the spacecraft came from the inner solar system and flew past Pluto on the blue trajectory there. And uh, we'll show that again, comes past Jupiter, we're aiming for Pluto in 2015, it passes Pluto there, the blue, and in just four more years, it was going to arrive at MU69, PT1. Now, rather than saying PT1 or MU69, we decided to try and give this little object a name. And uh, after a public voting campaign, 34,000 names were suggested by 115,000 people and the one that received the most nominations just had 40 and that name was Ultima Thule. I, it's named after a mythical land in the deep north. Thule was uh, supposedly an island of the North Seas and Ultima Thule meant beyond Thule, a mysterious place. Now, a formal naming of the object after the flyby has given it the name Arrowcoth. So you can use any of those names for it, really. Now, in order to get the uh, navigation sorted out for New Horizons, we need you to know the, the orbit of 
Barakoff very nice and accurately. And they realized that it was going to pass in front of a number of stars and blot out the light from the stars in what's called a stellar occultation. And that's like a miniature eclipse, but it would only be visible with a very narrow line of positions across the Earth. And there are three of these occultations going to occur against background stars. And you can see the tracks drawn on the globes of the Earth there. So one of them, the first one goes through South America, across the South Atlantic and through South Africa. The next one goes right across the Pacific. And the third one again crosses South America. And they were going to be in June and July of 2017. So NASA sent a team of uh, uh, scientists down to both Argentina and South Africa, ready for the 3rd of June occultation. And you've guessed it, they saw absolutely nothing. The uh, surprise was, but uh, perhaps the object was much smaller than expected. Perhaps it was only a swarm of debris and not showing up on their instruments. But it turned out it was simply in the wrong place. So they missed the event. Two chances left. The second one was over the Pacific. So they used SOFIA, the Flying Infrared Observatory, with a telescope mounted in a 747 here, out over the Pacific. And they tried to observe the event, but they thought they'd missed it completely again, which is very disappointing. However, when they got back to the lab, they discovered a very brief drop in the light from the target star. So they had managed to pin it down. Now that and the timing of that was very helpful in refining the orbit and giving them the best possible chance for a third go for the third possible event. It was only two weeks later, Again, this time down in Argentina, they took 24 16-inch telescopes, like the one in the picture there, and placed them in a fence line right across the track of the projected line of the eclipse and going either side of it, so covering four and a half kilometers. So one of the telescopes, at least, was bound to catch it this time. They were not taking any chances. And that worked, and it worked extremely well. Here are the tracks from five of the telescopes and two either side. The two either side missed it. The five in the middle all saw a different dip in the light. And the dip in the light shows when the ob star was obscured by the object and when it was revealed. And the length of that dip tells us something about the size of the object uh, in the particular position that the uh, telescope was. Here's the actual film of the dip from one of the telescopes, the repeats, so you can see it, there we go again, and the star disappears and reappears right in the centre of the movie there. There it goes. Now if we look at those tracks, what you could see is that you could fit two circles, a 20 kilometer and an 18 kilometer circle, that would roughly line up with where the dips in those tracks had occurred and been detected. And that's rather suggestive of the sort of two-lobed shape. This is an image of the Rosetta comet, Comet 67P, overlaid on top of those, showing that it's uh, possible that an object with that shape would create that sort of uh, timing of disappearances. Now that uh, refined the orbit nicely and were able to then image it from the New Horizons telescope and uh, that allowed them of course to finalize the trajectory for a flyby. So on the 1st of January of 2019 at 5.30 UTC in the morning a flyby would take place just three and a half thousand kilometers above the surface and that would give the camera, the high resolution camera, a resolution of 30 meters per pixel on the surface, which is very good. Now this event was happening 43.4 AU from the sun, and AU is the Earth-Sun distance, so 43 times as far away. 
and light and radio waves traveling at the speed of light take six hours to reach us here on earth from that distance so we would have to wait from 5 30 in the morning when the event took place another six hours to 11 30 before the data would be arriving and uh, we would be able to tell whether it was successful and then after that the bulk data would be, take about a year to download because of the very very slow speed of communication at that distance now, this is the first picture from the flyby it worked and indeed we see that two lobed shape exactly as predicted by the stellar occultation traces so this is Ultima Thule or Arakoth taken at a distance of 85,000 miles. A little movie here of it as the spacecraft was approaching it, it took a number of shots and you can see how the two lobes are still effectively spinning around their centre of mass here and a number of shots taken in the uh, still frames at the bottom there showing that. So we think this is indicating how the object was formed in that round about the dawn of the solar system there would have been a lot of small lumps, small bits of uh, space rock whizzing around and perhaps some of them clustered together under gravity and then started co-orbiting and we probably ended up with uh, two main lumps, the rest being kicked out and thrown away in the interactions which gradually spiralled in together until they softly bumped together and merged to form the shape of the two lobed object we see today. So here again is a sort of uh, attempt to show you the object in 3D and actually when you look at this you can realise that the uh, shape of it is not two spheres stuck together. You can see that there's considerable flattening in that uh, 3D image. So. Here's a really high resolution black and white picture of the two lobes stuck together and you can imagine that larger lobe is, is almost pancake shaped. This is the sort of model, the original idea was perhaps it would just be two round balls but no we think it's much more flattened objects with the larger one being especially flattened and spinning around, around that central uh, spin axis that you can see marked there. And that probably makes a lot of sense because gravity would have pulled together all of this material and the swirling clouds of objects tend to coalesce into flat disks. They tend to end up with one dominant uh, direction of spin and everything else being flattened out. So you can imagine that uh, the, the two objects would have been spinning in towards each other, the odd little collision going on and then the tidal effects, the drag from collisions and from gas and dust would gradually reduce the angular spin, the angular momentum, until they would bump into each other and form the object that we see today. Now we've also looked at uh, Arakoth with the spectrometer and been able to see that colour image on the far side there shows us the different regions of different minerals that there are within the one larger co component object. And what this is telling us is that indeed each of those large objects themselves coalesced out of a series of smaller lumps that st stuck together one after another building these larger and larger objects. So you can see the early building blocks that have gone together and then uh, merged and formed the complex structure that we see now. And I think we just got one more slide here, which is the disappearing uh, into the distance as New Horizons whizzed past, looking back towards Arakoth with just the outline of it lit up. And we're looking at the uh, unlit side away from the sun. So New Horizons is continuing on its way. There's a very, very small amount of fuel left now, and no decision has been made as to whether to try and attempt yet another rendezvous but uh, it would seem to be a, sh a shame not to try. Right, so thank you very much. That's the story of New Horizons and Beyond Pluto.